If you have your Bibles, uh, would you turn with me to John chapter 3? We're going to continue in our exposition of the Gospel of John and pick up where we left off two weeks ago um, in this encounter between our Lord and a rabbi, a teacher, a member of the Sanhedrin that came to him asking a question. And Christ walked him through this explanation of this new birth that needs to be experienced by everybody in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. And he talked about how unless someone is born of water, which we determined is the word, and the spirit, the spirit being the Holy Spirit, cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And this was pretty amazing to this guy, Nicodemus. And so Christ says in verse 7, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And if you remember two weeks ago, we talked about the wind. There's that wind sermon. And we talked about how what Christ was saying here is, is telling us something about the Spirit. Remember some of the things, it's uncontrollable, it's sovereign. The wind is uh, beyond our comprehension. The wind is uh, its own power that moves where it will. And so it is with all those things with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, is sovereign. The Holy Spirit is working in different areas and different places. The Holy Spirit is uncontrollable. And so we come to our text this morning in verse 9. And what's going to happen here is we're going to transition from Jesus ending the conversation, not stressing the things beyond Nicodemus' knowledge, but in fact faulting him for not believing what is within his ability and within his knowledge. So within his ability to grasp and within his knowledge. We've talked about this before. We've talked about Theology doesn't save, right? Good theology does not save you. You can know a lot of good theology. You can know a lot of stuff and still not believe. It is belief that saves. Not intellectual ability, not intellectual comprehension. Certainly that's important, right? We renew our minds, we're... we're told the gospel and we have to intellectually understand certain things, right? Uh, one of my professors, Bruce Ware, taught me systematic theology and he had this progression. It's head, heart, hands. So we hear and it becomes a head knowledge. The problem is that for too many people that stays at that head knowledge level. This is the case with Nicodemus. Nicodemus knew a lot of stuff, but the problem was that it had not migrated from his head to his heart and then out into his hands because that migration from the head to the heart is the new birth. And he had not experienced this new birth yet. So this text that we're going to talk about now, that we're going to move into, is not merely about the new birth, but what was already foreshadowed in Scripture that would take place, namely the cross. So Christ is now moving from talking about the results, or now moving to talk about the results of the new birth. So what the new birth is has been explained, and now he's going to talk about how this process happens where we are born again. Because that's the question that we all want to know, right? We can understand what the new birth is intellectually. We can theologically understand that, but if we can't bridge that gap between what we intellectually know and what needs to happen to make it a reality, then we're really no better off. And so Christ is going to bridge that gap today. And, and as we start, we need to understand that Christ's words in verse 9, and, or actually in verse 10, and Nicodemus' question in verse 9 relate directly to what he says in verse 8. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, and you do not know where it comes from, where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Remember two weeks ago, we, saw, we talked about how you can't see the wind, but you can see the effects of the wind. Right? You can see the tree blowing. You can see a new life 
that's patterned after that of Christ, that's growing in holiness, that's growing in love for the Lord. You don't see the force behind it that caused that to happen. And so Nicodemus, on the heels of that, says, how can these things be? And, and literally what that means is, how can this happen? How in the world can this happen? How, how can what happen? Well, how can the new birth happen? He's asking the question that we need to be asking at this point in the text. And we, one thing we've got to understand about Nicodemus is he had taught for years that the conditions to enter the kingdom of heaven were obedience, right? The law, being good enough, keeping all of God's law. If you can keep God's law, you can get into heaven, right? That's true. If you, for your entire life, from the time of conception on through death, can keep every one of God's laws perfectly. And not just externally, but internally, in your heart too, right? That's the kicker. That's the part that always gets us. Because I can just be nice to somebody, right? Externally. I can see somebody broken down on the side of the road and I can pull over and, and give them a hand. I can, I can come to church. I can... You know, I can go participate in this or that ministry. I can, externally, yeah, I can put on a good show. But the problem is in our hearts, which lead to our actions. God does not just want behavior. He wants your heart. And that's the conundrum that we find ourselves in, right? And, and for years... This teacher, this member of the Sanhedrin, had taught that if you obey the law, if you do what you're supposed to do, if you do the sacrifices that you're supposed to do, if you do the rituals that you're supposed to do, if you observe the feasts and festivals like you're supposed to do, then you're good. But the problem is that all of those things, if we've seen, sh foreshadowed something greater. And this teacher of Israel, with all of his education, did not understand that. He did not understand that. This idea of birth from above was a brand new idea to him. And he, quite honestly, he's skeptical that this can take place. Uh, Kasper Kretschiger, who was a reformer, said this. He refutes, in, in this verse, and actually in verse 13, Christ is going to refute this, but this is important to understand here. He says, Christ refutes the error of the Pharisees who thought that they were able to remove sin and appease the wrath of God by their own efforts. Okay, I'll come back to the rest of that quote here in a minute, but I just want to highlight that this is the, this is the, the mentality that, that this guy Nicodemus has, right? What are you talking about? What, remember the, remember the, the, the kid that came to Christ and said, what do I have to do to in, in, in enter the kingdom of heaven, right? And Christ says, oh, it's simple. Just obey the commandments. So he's like, well, which ones? Yeah, you know the commandments. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. <laughs> I've done all of those ever since I was born. I've... <laughs> That's, the arrogance of that just blows me away because that's a ridiculous statement to begin with. But this guy legitimately was trying to keep this stuff, right? And then what did he say? Christ said, okay, well, fine, that's good. Well, go ahead and sell everything you have and, and come follow me. And he went away sad. Why was he sad? Because he loved his treasure on earth more than he loved the treasure that he would get in Christ. He'd done all the good stuff, but the heart wasn't right. And so in verse 9, when Nicodemus says, how can these things be? How can this new birth happen? I don't believe this can actually happen. Christ responds in verse 10 and says, are you not the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? This is a sharp retort. 
as a teacher of Israel, Nicodemus, above all others, should have understood the need for a new heart because it has been abundantly clear in Scripture, in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, the need for a new heart. In fact, God has gone so far as to say, I don't want sacrifices, I want a clean heart. What, what does the psalmist say? Who can enter the gates? Enter the presence of the Lord. He that has clean hands and a pure heart. Jeremiah. Ezekiel. The text that we read a couple weeks ago. I will replace their heart of stone with a heart of flesh. In Ezekiel 36. This has all been abundantly clear in scripture. God has been working toward this. Since the creation and fall of mankind. And Nicodemus above all, with all of his training, with all of his intellectual ability, with all of his education, should have been able to understand this. He, above any other in Israel, should have understood this. Notice that, that it says, are you not the teacher of Israel? Right? Not just a teacher of Israel, the teacher of Israel. So Nicodemus apparently was someone of such stature and such learnedness and such ability that he had risen to the status of being one of the, if not the, primary teachers in Israel. And yet this titan of theology did not understand something as elementary as a new birth. Jesus is not doing anything new here. And his rebuke comes because everything that he's saying should have been understood or was Nicodemus was capable at least of understanding it because of everything that had been taught and everything that God had built up in the Old Testament leading toward this. Then he says in verse 11, Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Now there's something really interesting that happens in verse 11, right? Christ goes from I to we. He goes from speaking singularly to plurally. Just like in verse 7, if you go back there, do not marvel that I, say to, that I said to you, you must be born again. If you've got in, in mind, right, that, that second you in verse 7, do not marvel when I say to you, you, that you right there, must be born again. It's got a little number 5 next to it, really tiny up top. And down at the bottom of my Bible here, it says, the Greek for you is plural here. So Christ is not saying you individually, you, you. He's saying you people, you all, Israel. Everybody must be born again. And yet here he comes and he moves from that singular to the plural again. And he says, we speak of what we know and bear witness of what we have seen. So who is this we? Who's here? It's, it's, as far as we know, the only people that have been involved in this discussion have been Nicodemus and Christ. Remember when, when Nicodemus came at the beginning? In verse 2, this, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher that has come from God. Who's the we there? Well, the we there was a group of people that apparently had heard Christ's teaching and recognized who he was, at least in part, because of what he had done in his miracles. Remember we talked about that? So Christ here, in this ironic twist, comes around and uses plural, we. Now who is he talking about? I've heard some people say that he's talking about the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Remember in Genesis? The problem with that is that I don't think you can support that from the context of this passage, number one. And number two, nowhere else does Christ really talk like that. If you look at the high priestly prayer of John 17, he's praying to the Father, and he, use, he uses individual pronouns, right? Glorify me as I have glorified you. 
right? He's not like speaking in the, is it second person? Glorify us as we have glorified ourselves, right? So the Christ doesn't really talk like this in the, in the gospel. So I don't think you can support that that way. The other idea is that it's, um, it's the disciples in Christ, right? So when he says we speak of what we know, then he's talking basically about the, the 12 dudes that are following him and however many that came to faith um, in addition to those 12 and so, or 11. But um, I don't think that's it either. And here's why, because this is early. And, and Christ hadn't done a bulk of the teaching. And we're, as we're going to see, the disciples have a lot to learn and a lot to understand. When he says, what does he say? He says, we speak of what we know and bear witness of what we have seen. They haven't seen the transfiguration yet. They've seen some miracles, right? They saw the, the miracle at the wedding at Canaan. And then they saw um, some other miracles that he did, but they haven't seen what Christ has done. They, have, they haven't learned really who he is. They're following him. They're in the beginning stages of discipleship. They're not mature believers that are able to speak of what they know because they haven't seen it. They haven't witnessed it. So who in the heck is we? Here's what I think. I think based on the context and the, based on the way Christ is talking, I think we is referring to the prophets and the Old Testament. And here's why. What did Christ say? He said, you think that in the scriptures you can find eternal life. But, what? They testify of me. We speak of what we know. Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, standing before the throne of God, Seeing him high and lifted up and the angels circling around, circling around saying, holy, holy, holy. Seeing his own wretchedness and falling on his face and saying, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. And seeing the angel come down with the flaming coal and touch his lips and cleanse his lips. What is that a picture of? I think it's also clear, abundantly clear, from what we'll see in especially verse 13, which we'll come to that in a minute. So just keep in mind that the we, I think, is talking about the prophets in the Old Testament. We, the, the collective witness of my prophets that I have called, that I have spoken to, that have testified of what is going to happen, we all speak of what we know. And so, what do we see here? We see John in the New Covenant, the last prophet in, un, under the law, saying, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. That's his witness. Look at Christ. So he moves on in verse 12 and says this. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Earthly things is just simply things that take place here on earth. But what has Christ told him about? In the preceding verses, what has Christ told him about? He's told him about the new birth. Where does that new birth take place? It takes place here, on earth. It's elementary and it's foundational. If, and, and here's what's happening here. He's saying, I, this earthly thing happens here. You're born again here. Right? Certainly other things are happenly, happening in the heavenly realms. Right? We're transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. We're adopted as sons. Paul will develop this much more fully in the future. There's eschatological implications of Christ coming back in the final judgment and all of these other things and eternally spending uh, our time in the presence of God in Revelation. But Understand this. You can get none of that 
And by get, I don't mean only just have, but you can understand none of that unless you are born again. A lot of Christians, or professing Christians, will say, well, I, I just, all right, let me, give me an example. There's a guy in North Carolina, a guy in North Carolina has got a big church, big, 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 big church, right? Wrote a couple books, theology is all jacked up. And his big thing is, we don't care about theology at this church, he said, if you want to care about theology, then you can go in one of those hoity-toity churches like Grace Community Church or Bethlehem Baptist Church or one of those. We don't care about that. We care about seeking and saving the lost. So we are going to continue. And if you want to grow, go somewhere else. Right? Now, that's ridiculous, first of all. But second of all, if you don't experience and you don't understand something as simple as a new birth, if you don't understand something like being born again by the Spirit from above, new heart, new affections, new Lord, new life in Christ, you are not going to understand any of that theology. I can talk to you until we're blue in the face about adoption, election, about uh, the consummation of all things in Revelation. We can go through and we can talk about these things, but unless you've been born again, unless the Holy Spirit is living inside of you and is enlightening your mind and enabling you to understand these things, you won't get them. It's really that simple. What we know, if, if you can't understand a basic rudimentary principle like the new birth, you're not going to understand anything that's more heavenly, that's farther along, that's more advanced, right? What did Paul tell the Corinthians? You guys should be eating solid food now, but you're still nursing on milk. Because you don't care about growing. Why is there all this sin going on in the Corinthian church? Because they're not growing. Because they don't care about that stuff. Because they're still in love with the world. Because they, there are people within their body probably that haven't been fully transferred from the kingdom of the earth and the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light through this new birth. That's why regenerate church membership is so important. That's why the church is for born again believers primarily. Now, Corinthian church had people wandering in, and that's fine. But that's why we grow in our understanding of Scripture. That's why we actually care about theology. Because God, in His grace, has made us alive together with Christ, and we are born again, and we can understand these things, and we desire to grow in our knowledge and understanding of God. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe me, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Notice the emphasis on belief. I told you something, you didn't believe me. If you didn't believe me on that, how are you going to believe me on something else? It brings us to verse 13. He says, No one has ascended into heaven except... He who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. I'm going to finish this quote here that I started earlier. Specifically rever referring to verse 13. I'm going to start at the beginning so that we have some context. He refute, refutes the error of the Pharisees who taught that they were able to remove sin and appease the wrath of God by their own efforts. Christ removes this credit from all human beings, including Noah, Abraham, Moses, and all the saints. Basically what he says is no one has gone up into heaven, namely to appease the wrath of God. No one but I has gone up without a mediator to appease God's wrath. He gives the reason for this. Since I came down from heaven, I am he whom God promised he would send to take away sin and death. The deliverer who would come from heaven. Did you catch that? No one can ascend into heaven without a mediator. No one can stand before the throne of God and intercede for other people. No one can stand in God's presence on his own merit, on his own accord, except for the one that first descended to earth, namely Jesus Christ. 
This is an astounding statement. Moses, the mediator of the old covenant, couldn't do it. Ezekiel couldn't do it. The chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin couldn't do it. The only person who could ever stand before holy God and mediate for sinful people is holy God himself who comes down in human form. Go to Proverbs 30, verses 4 through 6. I stumbled upon this and it absolutely blew my mind. Proverbs 30, verses 4 through 6. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? What is his son's name? Surely you know. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Did you catch those different elements there? Who's ascended? Except the one who has come down. Who's gathered the wind in his fist? Who's wrapped the waters in his garments? It's very reminiscent of what Christ is using to explain this new birth. So what we see in Philippians 2, right? Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Those in the form of God did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but humbled himself, taking on the form of a servant, made himself nothing, right? Have you ever stopped to contemplate the absolute humility of just becoming man? Who can possibly intercede for us? Only the one whose home is not here on earth, but is in heaven. And who gave up that home, who gave up that glory, who gave up that right, and came down and became like his sinful creations and took on their form, yet remained fully God. And lived an entire life perfectly pleasing God, perfectly loving God, perfectly obeying God in everything, which culminated in his death. Can you do that? Can I do that? As the writer of Hebrews said, he was made a little lower than the angels. And what's the result of that, right? Philippians 2. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. No one has ascended into heaven in such a way as to return and talk authoritatively about heavenly things except for Christ. And then he says, and this is tremendous, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now there's two ideas here. The surface meaning is found in Numbers 21, 4 through 9. So go over to Numbers 21 real quick. It's in the beginning of the Old Testament. Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 9, and I'll read it. From Mount Hor... They set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. And we loathe this worthless food. Verse 6, Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people. So that many of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. 
So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on the pole. And if, the serp- if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Now this, ultimately, in this context, remember I said context was one of the reasons why I think that Christ is talking when he says we about the prophets. This is primarily why in context. Because he's referring back to the prophet of Israel, the big head honcho prophet, Moses, and showing something that Nicodemus should have seen. What happens here, why do we have this this record of this. This is a ridiculous story. There's absolutely no time, like it it doesn't have any sort of historical significance with their journey, right? You think about this. What what does this story, why is this in here? It's in here because it foreshadows something. Christ is using the Old Testament or an illustration from the Old Testament showing that Nicodemus as a teacher should have gotten this. And let me just say something real quick, right? Scripture says not many should be teachers for you fall under stricter judgment. A lot of people think that they can be a teacher because they understand something intellectually. Nicodemus also gives us an excellent case study in why not many should seek to be teachers. Intellectual understanding, intellectual knowledge alone does not qualify one to teach. And I am continually amazed at our, in our society at how many people want to teach this book. I don't want to teach this book. I do it because God has called me to it and given me joy in it. And when I do it, this is where I feel that I'm in his will and other people have validated that in my ministry. I don't want to do it. From a selfish standpoint, because I understand that everything that I say here, everything that, every time I open this, that, that reel that we always imagine is going in heaven where it's recording, it, it's like, it's an HD at that point. And when I get up there, it's going to be replayed. And I'm going to be accountable for everything that I teach. And that is no different between a pastor and a Sunday school teacher. Nicodemus taught the word of God and he missed the types and the shadows in the Old Testament because he was not filled with the Spirit, because he was not born again, because he was not able to understand the Word of God. God calls some people to teach. He gifts some people to teach. He gifts many other people in many other areas. So before you desire to teach... Before you desire to teach this book in any context, you need to check your heart. Is it for accolades? Is it for influence? Is it for honor? Is it for prestige? Is it for any a number of other reasons? Or is it because God has gifted you and called you to do that? And if he has gifted you and called you, what are you doing to equip yourself? Do not ever flippantly open this book and teach from it. I say that authoritatively to everyone here. Don't do it. Because if you do, you will be held accountable for it. Do you want to stand before the Lord and say, I taught all sorts of stuff, and he's like, well, it was a lot of it was wrong. I'm sure a lot of stuff I teach is wrong, right? Like, I'm sure I miss certain things. I'm human. I'm a a fallen person. I do. And so I rely on other people to speak into my life and to hold me accountable for that. But I've, I've done something to equip myself. Other people have done things to equip me. I get really nervous when I see somebody that isn't equipped saying that they want to teach. 
I get really nervous when somebody can't understand a principle as elementary to our faith as the new birth and they want to teach. Because Nicodemus comes to mind. Not many should be teachers. So Numbers 21. Let's think about that real quick. Numbers 21. Christ uses that example in Numbers 21. What do we see in that text? We see, first of all, that God gives new physical life, right? They're bitten by a serpent. They're going to die. Some people did die. And God provides a way for them to live. That's number one. Number two, here's what else I see. The necessity of belief and faith to receive life. Now think about this with me for a second. You get bit and somebody tells you that all you have to do is look at a serpent hanging on a stick that's bronze up there. And you'll be healed. Now how many of us would be like, that's medically ridiculous? I'll tell you what I need to do. If you're old school, you need to make an X. And you need to have your buddy suck the venom out. Right? If you're a little bit beyond that, I just need to sit in the shade of a tree and slow my heart rate down and relax so that the, my body has time to neutralize the venom until I need a snake bite kit, right? Anything but look at a bronze statue. That's absolutely ridiculous. But it came from the mouth of God. What is faith? Faith is believing that God is who he says he is and will do what he says he will do. So think of the tremendous amount of faith that it took for something as simple as to look at a bronze statue when you've just been bit and you're going to die. Think of the panic that you would experience and to think all I've got to do is look at that statue and I've got to trust God that he will heal me because that's what he said he would do. So we see that faith and belief are, nece or are necessary to receive that life. Also notice the intermediary through whom God gives life, Moses. Moses. Right? The people come to Moses. They say, Moses, we've sinned. We need forgiveness. Please talk to God. Do something for us. And Moses goes to the Lord, and then the Lord tells him, right? And he builds the, the little statue. Who's our intermediary? For we do not have a great high, or we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize, but one who in every way has been tested, yet without sin. So therefore, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy. We have a high priest who lives and a high priest who intercedes on our behalf. We have an advocate with the Father. One through whom we can go and have access to the Father. And we see that in this, this story, this picture, this parable, this shadow foreshadowing of Christ in Numbers chapter 21. Also notice the rebellion of Israel and the lack of faith which leads to this situation. Notice their lack of deservedness. Notice that God acts. They look. God acts. He's the one that determines how they're saved. He's the one that determines the means. Their responsibility is to look. To focus. To turn their eyes towards something. Finally, notice the means by which God gives life, which is gracious provision. They were saved physically in that instance by grace alone. Now, why is it so far-fetched that spiritual birth should be any different? Believe, look, hope, and live. But there's a deeper meaning, right? Christ says... The Son of Man must be lifted up. That refers to physically being lifted up on the cross, but also exalted. Being high and lifted up. So Christ was raised up on a cross, just like that serpent was raised up before Israel. But not only that, he did not die and stay dead, but he was resurrected and has been exalted and is seated, exalted at the right hand of God. Go to Isaiah 52, verse 13. Even in the suffering servant account, there's this idea of being glorified or exalted in his death, being raised up on a cross. 52, verse 13. Verse 13. 
Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up. He shall be exalted. Or you can look at John 17, 5. Father, I have glorified you here on this earth. Now glorify me. So how is he exalted? How does Jesus return to heaven, his home? By being lifted up on a cross. By the innocent person suffering for the guilty. By the most horrific thing that's ever happened in the history of humanity, God himself being raised up by his creation and murdered. Do you ever think about the fact that the object of our song and our delight and our joy and our praise in heaven in the ages to come will be murder and death and something that we see as such a painful, terrible thing here, but it was the moment when Christ defeated his enemies. It was the, modus, the moment of, of greatest triumph and victory for our Lord when he was lifted up on the cross and when the wrath of God was poured out upon him for sinners that would put their faith in him, for those that would look to him for salvation. The wrath of God meant for sinners poured on the Son of God and in exchange the, the righteousness of that Son being given to those undeserving sinners. Christ came to die. And the moment of his greatest exaltation was the moment of his greatest humiliation as well. You can look at Romans 8.28. It is the exaltation of Christ and his work on the cross that brings men to him. And then he says in verse 15, go back to 14, and Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That, why was he lifted up? What was the purpose? What was the reason? Whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Believe in Christ. Christ is in a completely different category from the bronze serpent. If you go and look in 2 Kings, Hezekiah, King Hezekiah actually had to destroy the thing because the Israelites were turning it into an idol and thinking if they just went and touched it or looked at it or whatever, they'd be healed of whatever ailments they had. Isn't that how we are? We don't have a bronze serpent. We've got the Son of God living, risen, redeeming people. It was grace that spared the Israelites, not a statue. So how can the new birth happen? It's through belief in the saving work of Christ on the cross. If you look in John 5, 26, God the Father gave that life would be in him, in Christ. In eleven twenty five, he is the resurrection and the life. Those who believe have life in him. So here's the application, right? Number one, the cross was not plan B. God didn't look at the old covenant and say, ah, oh, darn it, it's not working. I really had high hopes for this one. I thought if they just had all this stuff, they'd be able to figure it out. Now, the Old Testament foreshadows and points to Christ, and Christ points to the cross. The purpose of Christ's life, the purpose of him coming was to die to die on a cross. It was plan A the whole time. It was never plan B. The number, number two in application, believe. Don't ask Jesus into your heart. Don't do all these other things that we try to make up in our culture that are completely unbiblical, that you can't find one text to support. Repent and believe. It is that simple. On the cross, Christ took sin. He became sin who knew no sin so that in him we might be the righteousness of God. The new birth. The new birth take, takes place through belief in Christ. Through belief 
that his death was sufficient to appease the wrath of God through belief that his life was satisfactory in his obedience. By belief that you have nothing to offer him. Did you realize that we just read an entire text about the new birth and it said absolutely nothing about our effort? Our religious stamina? It's grace. It's grace. It's God's grace in giving his son for us. It's God's grace in him killing his son. What does it say? It says that it pleased God to crush him. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was wounded for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. It's the cross. It's grace. We take it for granted so often. We make it all about us. That does not exalt Christ at all when we make it about us. It is about him. It's about his grace. It's about his willingness to become nothing so that we might be sons and daughters of our Father in heaven. And the last one is this. Christ is exalted on the cross and in his resurrection, which reconciles us to him, allowing us to delight in and know him, thereby exalting him in our lives. Your main life vocation, my main life vocation, is to delight and revel and enjoy and be satisfied in Jesus Christ because we are reconciled to God through him and we have relationship with him. That's what the new birth is about. It's about relationship. It's about a changed heart that desires him, changed affections. Are you pursuing your life's vocation? Are you truly delighting in God? Are you truly finding yourself increasingly satisfied in him? What did we talk about in grace? I gave you that definition of grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor upon sinners, which causes them to see, seek, savor, and delight in him in increasing measure for eternity. How are you doing on that? How is your delight meter for how much you enjoy God? If it's low then your exaltation meter for how much you're exalting Christ is also pretty low. We exalt what we love. We enjoy what we love. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. So are we being satisfied in him? Or in other things? Because our purpose is to glorify and exalt this Christ to others. We can't do that if we're not satisfied in him ourselves. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. Don't even know what else to say after that because we could spend years just focusing on that. But Lord, I thank you that you did not only reveal yourself to us in Scripture, in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, in the Law, in the Prophets, but you revealed yourself to us in the person and work of Christ. And Lord, I'm thankful that you have given us a greater picture of you in Christ. That at that time when he was suffering and he was being exalted, that we get the most pure and beautiful picture of who you are. Lord, I'm thankful that you give us more than just that, that you show us what, who you are when he returns. And we get a complete picture of who you are, that we might fear you now, that we might turn to you, that we might repent, that we might believe. And Lord, I pray that you would grant those of us in this room that have not experienced this new birth to experience it. Would you send your spirit to invade our hearts and our lives and our minds? Would you not give us rest until we have repented and believed? And would you grant us the grace to continue that belief? 
Would you help us to be more satisfied in your son, to delight in him more? Would you give us opportunities to show that to other people? Would you give us opportunities to proclaim his excellencies? I pray that you would do all that and abundantly more than we could ask for now. In Jesus' name, amen.